voting rights that was stopped by Alabama state troopers. Congressman Lewis is also chairman of the host committee formed by the foundation of the National Archives to assist us in promoting our celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation this year, drawing more than 9,000 visitors to our rotunda over the New Year's holiday this year. The host committee is a distinguished group of former presidents and first ladies, civic and community leaders, historians, authors, journalists, and celebrities. He also contributed the introduction to a commemorative National Archives Emancipation Proclamation book, and tonight there are copies of the book signed by the congressman available for purchase in the lobby. And the congressman has graciously agreed to remain in the McGowan Theater lobby for a brief, brief period after the program. Described as a lawmaker whose fingerprints are on some of the nation's most significant tributes and monuments to the contributions of African Americans to American culture, the son of sharecroppers was inspired by the accounts of the Montgomery bus boycott and the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that he heard on radio broadcasts. The inspiration led to action, and as a student at Fisk University in Nashville, he organized sit-ins at segregated lunch counters. Later, he joined the Freedom Riders and helped form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which he later led. At the age of 23, he was the youngest speecher, speaker at the March on Washington in 1963 and the sole surviving speaker. And he helped organize the Bloody Sunday March in 1965 across Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. And he has made his mark as a public servant. In 1981, he was elected to the Atlanta City Council, then to Congress as a representative from Georgia in 1986. In the House, he has served in the Democratic leadership and today is a senior member of the important House Ways and Means Committee. Joining Congressman Lewis in conversation tonight is Scott Simon. Mr. Simon is the host of Weekend Edition Saturday on National Public Radio. He joined NPR in 1977 as chief of its Chicago Bureau. Since then, he has reported from all 50 states, covered presidential campaigns in eight wars, reported from Central America, Africa, India, the Middle East, and the Caribbean. He has received numerous honors for his reporting, including the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, the George Foster Peabody Award, the Presidential End Hunger Award, a Unity Award in Media, and a 1982 Emmy. When he was awarded the 2010 Medal of Freedom, Congressman Lewis said, I think it's important for people to know the whole story and the full story of American for generations yet unborn. It's important to leave these museums, these little pieces of history to inspire, inform, and educate unborn generations. I can't think of a better place to be having this conversation tonight than here at the National Archives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Simon and Congressman John Lewis. Uh, I'm going to open in a way that might be slightly uh, redundant with the congressman. I am um, fortunate enough to, uh, to have two young children, so I'm learning history all over again. And one of the things you learn is, of course, that we all uh, stand on the shoulders of uh, great men and women who've gone before us. And I think no pair of shoulders in the history of America are wider and stronger than those on this man here, John Lewis. So, I'm sure he's going to be great, he's going to be enlightening, he's going to be funny, he's going to be warm, he's going to be pointed, he's going to be moving, he's going to be inspiring. But before we ask him to utter a word, could we stand and, on behalf of America, give him an ovation for what he's done for us? So how many times have you been arrested? Well, during the 60s, no. 
But during the 60s, I was arrested and jailed uh, 40 times. And uh, since I've been in Congress, uh, I got arrested about four times. <laughs> for all, all for matters of principle, we yes, should explain. They, they were when all, you're talking about a member of Congress, that's not always yes, the case. Yes, yeah, you know? but there was uh, <laughs> protesting around the problems in South Africa yeah. and uh, the Sudan. Uh, a group of us as members of Congress uh, went to jail. Mr. Lewis, what was it like to be in a prison in the segregated south of the United States in the 1960s when even the prisons were segregated? Well, I must tell you, it was not uh, simple, not uh, easy. You get arrested with uh, your fellow sisters and brothers who happen to be white, uh, Asian American, um, Native American, um, Latino. But when you were put in a jail, you were segregated. Mm. Uh, you didn't only face segregation in the outside world, but to be arrested in Nashville, or to be arrested in Birmingham, or, or Montgomery, or Selma, or Atlanta, you saw segregation. You saw racial discrimination. Uh, segregation was real. Uh, when I was growing up in, in, in rural Alabama, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. And I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. Yeah. But I was inspired to get in trouble. Good trouble, necessary trouble. So going to jail, it became a place, whether it was in Mississippi or in Tennessee or Alabama, where we learned, we studied. We studied the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence in jail. We conducted nonviolent workshops, made us stronger, made us more determined to fight a good fight. Um, about, and I realize you've got to be approximate about this, about how many times were you assaulted, beaten for your beliefs? Oh, a few times here and there. But I, I didn't try to keep up with the number of times that someone punched me or poured uh, cold water or hot water on me or hit me in the face of someone would spit on us. Um, I guess the worst incident occurred uh, during a sit-in mm -hmm. uh, when someone, uh, the owner, locked us up in a little restaurant. This is in Nashville? In Nashville. Yeah. And tried to fumigate the place with us in it. And the local uh, fire uh, officials from the fire department came up and, and broke the one windows and ordered the man to open the doors and let us out. What were those first freedom rides like? Well, I must tell you, Scott, I, I, I came to Washington, D.C. the first time in 1961. Mm -hmm. Had all of my hand a few pounds lighter. And it was 13 of us, yeah. seven whites and six African Americans. Back in 1961, black people and white people couldn't board a Greyhound bus and be seated together or trailway bus and leave the city of Washington and travel through the rest of the South. I, I hadn't been to Washington, but on that night, on, on, on one night, we came here May 1st, mm -hmm. training and orientation, you know, the night of May 3rd, we went to a Chinese restaurant. Now, growing up in rural Alabama, tennis school in Nashville, Tennessee, I'd never been to a Chinese restaurant before. Never had Chinese food. We had a wonderful meal, unbelievable meal. They had the lazy uh, Susan, you call them? Lazy Susan. Right. Yeah. And covered dishes, and you turn and turn. The food was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful meal. But someone said that night, eat well. This may be like the Last Supper. The next morning, May 4th, a group of us boarded a trailway bus, and others boarded a Greyhound bus. And I will never forget it. We arrived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a young man, young African-American man, entered a so-called white waiting room and tried to get a shoe shine 
in a so-called white barber shop that had a shoe shine stand, was arrested and taken to jail. And later, the next morning, he went to trial and the jury dismissed the charges against him. My seatmate, a young white gentleman, the two of us tried to enter a white waiting room, white waiting in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It's about 35 miles from Charlotte. Mm -hmm. The moment we walked through the door, a group of young men attacked us and left us lying in a pool of blood. And the local officials came up and wanted to know whether we wanted to press charges. We said no. We come with peace, with love. We believe in nonviolence. But many years later, one of the individuals that had attacked me and my seatmate came to my Washington office, February 09, about a month after President Obama had been inaugurated. And with his son, his son been encouraging his father to seek out the people that he had wronged. And this man said to me, he said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that beat you. Will you forgive me? I want to apologize. The young son started crying. He started crying. I started crying. The two of them hugged me. I hugged them back. They called me brother. I called him brother. And I saw them four different times after that day. That's what the movement was all about, to be reconciled, to lay down the burden of race. What do you, let me ask you to use your your fine sense of human intelligence and character to to tell us what went on in those folks over the years. What 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 turned their hearts, do you think? I think many people grew to believe that, you know, it's not a vast difference in, in humankind. They saw many of us living by the teaching of Gandhi, the teaching of the great teacher, the teaching of Martin Luther King Jr. And they didn't see hate in us. They saw us as peaceful participants that wanted to bring people together. And all across the American South, I run into people every day, say, thank you. Thank you for freeing me. Thank you for making me a little more human. And we hug, we laugh, and sometimes we cry. Uh, Dr. King used to speak about the ability of the movement to transform people, to redeem the soul of America. We wanted to create the beloved community. And I think people saw that. That we didn't hate, we didn't become bitter or hostile. We wanted to become one community, one family, what I like to call one house. Not just the American house, but the world house. Let me, by the way, I think um, you and I are probably playing a little bit to the C SPAN cameras. I think everybody wants to get a good look at you, Mr. Lewis. So okay, okay. Address the. Um, could I get you to take us back to that day, March 7, 1965, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma? This is, this is like Beacon Hill in America. Well, history. you must remember that Selma was located in the heart of the Black Belt of Alabama. Mm -hmm. In Selma in 1965, only 2.1 percent of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. People have been standing in unmovable lines. My old organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC, had been working there off and on since 1962. After the March on Washington in 1963, many of us went into Selma work. We went into Mississippi and other places. In order to become a registered voter in Selma, in Dallas County, you had to pass a so-called literacy test. People were asked to interpret some section of the Constitution of the state of Alabama. On one occasion, a man was asked to count the number of bubbles on a bar of soap. On another occasion, a man was asked to count the number of jelly beans in a jar. There was a sheriff in the Selma in Dallas County, Alabama, by the name of Jim Clark. 
He was a big man, tall. He wore a gun on one side, a nightstick on the other side, and he carried an electric cap router in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said never. And sometime I felt a Sheriff Clark would just mean that he went to bed mean, he dreamed mean, <laughs> and, and got up mean. And he just made it hard and difficult for many of the citizens yeah. to make it up those steps to attempt to get registered. So in the hometown of Mrs. Coretta Scott King, a little town called Marion, Alabama, about 35 miles from Selma, there was a demonstration in mid-February, and a young man tried to protect his mother. There was a confrontation. He was shot in the stomach and died a few days later at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma. And because of what happened to him, we made a decision that we will march from Selma to Montgomery to dramatize to the nation and to the world that people of color wanted to register to vote. One of the counties that we had to pass through, Lowndes County, the county was more than 80% African American, but didn't have a single registered African American voter in the county. So on Sunday, March 7, 1965, after church, we conducted a nonviolent workshop, and more than 600 people lined up to walk from Selma to Montgomery. We came to the edge of the Emma Pettus Bridge, crossing the Alabama River. Down below, we saw all of this water, and a young man by the name of Jose Williams from Dr. King's organization, walking with me, said, John, can you swim? I said, no. I said, Jose, can you swim? He said, yes, a little. And I said something like, well, there's too much water down there. We're not going to jump. We're going straight ahead. Now, Scott, I was wearing a backpack before it became fashionable to wear backpacks. <laughs> and in this backpack, I had two books. I thought we were going to be in jail, and I wanted to have something to read. <laughs> I wanted to have something to eat. I had one apple and one orange. That wouldn't last long. And since I was going to be in jail with my friends, my colleagues, my neighbors, I wanted to be able to brush my teeth. So I had toothpaste and a toothbrush. We continued to walk. No one said a word. We come to the highest point on the Edna Pettus Bridge. Down below, we saw a sea of blue Alabama State Troopers. And behind the state troopers, we saw members of Sheriff Clark Posse. He had requested that all white men over the age of 21 to come down to the county courthouse on a Saturday night, March 6, to be deputized to stop the march. We came within hearing distance of the state troopers. A man spoke up and said, I'm Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. This is an unlawful march. It would not be allowed to continue. You should go back to your homes or return to your church. And Jose Williams said, Major, give us a moment to kneel and pray. And the Major said, Troopers advance. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. They came toward us, beating us with nightsticks, tramping us with the horses, and releasing the tear gas. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I was the first one to take a blow. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. I thought it was my last nonviolent protest. And somehow, in some way, I, I, I guess I lost consciousness. And I don't remember, I don't recall, 48 years later, I made it back across that bridge to the church. I guess someone just carried me back. But I do recall being back at this little church, Brown Chapel Amy Church. The church is full to capacity. More than 2,000 people on that side trying to get in. And someone said, John, says something to the audience. Says something. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. How President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam. But can I send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to and the next thing I knew had been admitted to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma. It was a little Catholic hospital. 
mm -hmm. operated by a group of nuns. They was brave. They were brave. They took care of us. Seventeen of us are hospitalized. Early the next morning, that Monday morning, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy came to Selma. They came to my bedside. Dr. King said, John, don't worry. We will make it from Selma to Montgomery. And the Voting Rights Act will be passed. And he told me that he had sent out a request for ministers and priests and rabbis and nuns and religious leaders to come to Selma. And on that Tuesday, March 9th, more than a thousand religious leaders came to Selma. And later that night, that evening, three young ministers, one by the name of Reverend James Reed from Boston, went out to get something to eat at a little restaurant. On their return to Brown Chapel Amy Church in the heart of the African American community, they were attacked by members of the Klan. And Reverend Reed was so severely beaten, he had to be transferred to a hospital in Birmingham. And the next day he died. And because of what happened in Selma, President Johnson called Governor Wallace to Washington to try to get assurance from him that he would be able to protect us. We went into federal court. There was a wonderful jury, the late Frank M. Johnson, mm -hmm. wonderful man. I testified what happened. I testified in this court during the Freedom Rise in 61. He ordered <coughs> Governor Wallace and others not to interfere with the march. Governor Wallace could not assure the president that he would be able to protect us. So President Lyndon Johnson came to Congress on March 15th eight days after Bloody Sunday, and in my estimation, made one of the most meaningful speeches any American president had made in modern time on the whole question of voting rights or civil rights. Mm -hmm. He started that speech off that night by saying, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and for the destiny of democracy. To paraphrase him, he said something like, at time, history and fate meet in a single place in man unending search for freedom. So it was more than a century ago at Lexington and at Concord. So it was at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. He introduced the voting rights act, and before he concluded that speech, he said, and we shall overcome. So today in the movement, we call it the we shall overcome speech. The Congress gave him a standing ovation. I was sitting next to Martin Luther King Jr in the home of a local family as we watch and listen to President Johnson. And I looked at Dr. King. Tears came down his face. I started crying. And he said, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery, and the voting rights act will be passed. President Johnson called out part of the military to protect us all the way during those five days of walking from Selma to Montgomery. And when we arrived in Montgomery, not just 600 people, there was more than 25,000 people from all over America. Some members of Congress, elected officials came, the religious community, mm -hmm. the change America. So, but the only thing I did, I just gave a little blood. <laughs> uh, some people gave that very line. Um, <clears throat> how do you love your country? after what happened to you. How, how do I? Yeah. How, how, how did you maintain or grow to love the United States after what happened to you? Well, I continue to, to I love America. I wanted to make America better. I wanted to make America live up to those principles. That we're one people, we're one family, we're one house. And it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, a Latino, or Asian American, or Native American, that we're one. 1963, the March on Washington, this is <clears throat> one of the anniversaries that, uh, that we're observing. I have read <clears throat> that you are the only speaker at the March in Washington who's still with us. That, so far as you know, that's the case. 
Well, I have a list. I remember the speakers. Yeah. Uh, I, I spoke number six. Yeah. Dr. King spoke number ten. It was a wonderful. It was a wonderful coalition, a coalition of conscience, we called it. But you know, before the, the march itself, President Kennedy had invited us to the White House. Mm -hmm. We met with him in, in June of 1963. And we told him that we were going to have a march. At least Mr. Randolph, A. Philip Randolph, mm -hmm. was considered the dean of African American leadership. He had threatened Roosevelt with the march. He was always wanting to have a march on Washington. So he convinced us that it was time for us to march. Yeah. And a few days later, after meeting with President uh, Kennedy, we met in New York City at the old Roosevelt Hotel mm -hmm. on... Uh, 42nd. Right, 42nd. Yeah. I walk by there sometime. Sometime I just want to go in and find that room where we met. It, it, we, we met there, the six of us, and in that meeting we invited four major white religious and labor leaders to join us. And we issued the call for the march. We thought maybe we'd get 50 or 60 or 70,000 people. But we went all around the country. Mr. Randolph was the chair. And Beat Rustin was his deputy. Mm -hmm. And we had a young lady who worked in, uh, in the march office in, in New York. You can call up any time of night, any time of morning, and say, Rochelle, how many people come in from New York? How many buses are coming from Philadelphia? How many people come in from Boston? How many people are going to be on that train coming from the South? How many people are coming from the West Coast? And she could give us a number. And I remember so well that morning, August 28, 1963, the 10 of us, the six plus the four, came up on Capitol Hill. We met with the leadership of the House, both Democrats and Republicans. We went on the Senate side, mm -hmm. Constitution Avenue, and we met with the Republican leadership, the Democratic leadership, and we came out of those buildings. And we can see a sea of humanity coming from Union Station. And we knew it was going to be big. We were supposed to be leading the march. The people were already marching. It was like saying, there go my people. Let me catch up with them. <laughs> and, 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 and this sea of humanity just pushed us, pushed us. So we just locked on and started moving toward the Washington Monument, on toward the Lincoln Memorial was a wonderful period, I think, in American history. Now, I have read a few accounts that suggest that you, uh, you had some remarks that you were prepared to make, and uh, people wanted to change them. Well, that is true. Mm -hmm. My original speech was pretty strong. Um, some people in the administration took the position that if a person had a sixth grade education, he should be considered literate and should be able to register to vote. My old organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we took the position that the only qualification for being able to register and vote should be that of age and residence. While I was working on my speech with the help and encouragement of my colleagues, I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March on Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too, it must be ours. Then down further in the speech, I said something like, we're involved in a serious revolution. Some people didn't like me using the word revolution. And another part of this speech, I talked about the black masses, the black masses, as A. Philip Randolph was there. Mm -hmm. They said, why are you using that? And A. Philip Randolph came to my rescue. So that's nothing wrong with the use of the word revolution. There's nothing wrong with black masses. I use it myself sometime. Yeah. So that part stayed in the speech. But in the beginning, I said, in the proposed speech, not 
Today we march for jobs and freedom. But we don't have anything to be proud of. For many of our brothers and sisters cannot be here. They're receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. And then down further in the speech, I talked about the party of Kennedy is the party of Eastland. The party of Javis, the Rockefeller, is the party of Goldwater. Where is our party? And near the end of the speech, this is what got to some people. Near the end of the speech, I'm down in the body, and near the end. I said, you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. We cannot be patient. We cannot wait. We want our freedom, and we want it now. And by Rustin said, John, you cannot say we cannot be patient. <laughs> I think you would have just been facetious. Yeah. You said the Catholic Church believe in being patient. You cannot say that. So we sort of slip over that. But then near the end of the speech, they had a line in there that said, if we do not see meaningful progress here today, the day will come when we will not confine our margin on Washington we may be forced to march through the South the way Sherman did, nonviolently. It's oh no. So, so, so the negotiation started. And uh, so by the time we got to Mr. Lincoln, we had a little conference, a consultation with Mr. Wilk and Roy Wilkin of the NACP. A. Philip Randolph and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King said to me, John, that didn't sound like you. Mm-hmm. And A. Philip Randolph said, John, we come this far together. Can we stay together? <laughs> and I couldn't say no to A. Philip Randolph, a man that I love yeah. and admire. I couldn't say no to Martin Luther King Jr. He was my hero, my inspiration. I first heard of him in 1955 when I was 15 years old. I met him in 1958 when I was 18. And, you know, it was play on words, a little rhetoric here and there. And so we changed it. And I suggested that we will march through certain cities, certain towns, certain villages, certain hamlets. And I, in the end, I said, wake up, America, wake up, America. That's the rest good. is history. Um, I did want to ask you about some of the... the uh, noted people that you've, you've known over the years. And let's begin with Dr. King. Um, this, uh, this is a man whose uh, who's birthday, whose life we now celebrate every year as a national holiday. You, you knew him well before he was a national holiday. What was he well, like? Well, um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a wonderful, just a wonderful man, wonderful human being. I, I try to make this short. Mm. But when, when I was growing up, Outside of Troy, Alabama, finishing in high school in 1957, I wrote Dr. King a letter and told him I needed his help. I needed his support. I wanted to attend a little state college called Troy State, only 10 miles from my home. Mm-hmm. Didn't admit black students. He wrote me back, sent me around to Greyhound, bus ticket. He knew I was very, very poor, didn't have any money. I, I didn't tell my mother, my father, any of my teachers, any of my sisters or brothers. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee. An uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. He gave me a foot locker. As a little boy, I used to raise chickens, and I used to preach to the chickens. So I put everything in that footlocker that I own except those chickens and went off to school to Nashville. And after being there for about two weeks, I told one of my teachers that I've been in touch with Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This teacher knew Dr. King very well. They both had attended Morehouse College together in Atlanta. So he informed Dr. King that I was in school in Nashville. So Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. got back in church with me and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. So in March of 1958, by this time I'm 18 years old, mm-hmm. I boarded a Greyhound bus, traveled from Troy to Montgomery, and a young lawyer 
by the name of Fred Bray, who was the lawyer for Rosa Parks and Dr. King, mm -hmm. and became our lawyer during the sit-ins, or during the Freedom Rides in the March from Selma to Montgomery, met me at the Greyhound bus station, and drove me to the First Baptist Church, pastored by Reverend Ralph Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King, and ushered me in to the pastor's study of the office of the church. I saw Dr. King standing behind a desk with Reverend Ralph Abernathy. I was so scared. I didn't know what to say, what to do. And Dr. King spoke up and said, are you the boy from Troy? Are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. <laughs> and that was the beginning. This man, I admired him. I love this man. He inspired me. He lifted me. He induced me with the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence, along with a man by the name of Jim Lawson. He, in a sense, he was a funny man. Mm -hmm. He could tell jokes, make you laugh. Dr. He, King told jokes. Oh, yeah, he would tell jokes. He would uh, say, John, do you try to preach now? I said, yes, sometimes, Dr. King, uh, when I'm taking a shower. <laughs> and, and he would just laugh. And he would mock some of the uh, ministers that he knew, oh. or some of the deacons in the church. Yeah. And he was laugh at his own joke. <laughs> he thought it was so funny. <laughs> It was work. wonderful. I remember one time we were traveling in Alabama someplace. There was some hole in the wall restaurant. I said, let's stop and get something to eat. If we get arrested and go to jail, we're going to full stomach. <laughs> and he thought it was funny. Right. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, I think it's safe to say, what was Bull Connor like? Oh, Bull Connor. He was, a, he was something. He, um, on one hand... He could be very mean. On the other hand, when we were taken out of jail during the Freedom Ride in, in, in Birmingham, taken out of jail, seven of us, he had already arrested two young people at the city limit of Birmingham, a young black man and a young white man, because they were sitting on the front seat of the bus, and they refused to move, because segregation was strictly enforced yeah. in Birmingham. He... Uh, one night, about 4 o'clock on a Friday morning, he came up to our jail cells and said he was taking us back to Nashville. Now, he, we were traveling on a regular Greyhound bus, and he asked to see all of our tickets. And our tickets read from Nashville to Birmingham, Birmingham to Montgomery, Montgomery to Jackson, Jackson to New Orleans. So he let the regular passenger get off the bus, kept us on the bus. Then he ordered the police officials to place newspaper and cardboard over the windows, the windshield, the back of the bus, to keep the photographers and the reporters from seeing us inside of the bus. Mm -hmm. Took us, placed us in jail, placed us in protected custody, and then had several cars he was in the car, riding in the same car with me. And he said, he kept telling us, he was taking us back to Nashville, to our college campuses. And one of the young ladies in the group said, uh, Mr. Connor, Mr. Commissioner. That's right, he was a safety commissioner. He was a safety, not, yeah. director of public safety, commissioner of public okay. safety. So you can have lunch, or you can have breakfast with us in the student union at Fisk University, Tennessee State University, at Vanderbilt. So he was talking, he was engaging. And we arrived at the Tennessee, Alabama state line. He said, I'm letting you all off here. Hmm. It was clan territory. He said, you can make it back the best way. A bus will be coming along, a train will be coming along, but you cannot come back to Alabama. So we start walking. And one of the young African-American students said, there must be some black people here. There must be some colored folks here someplace. And we kept walking. We came up on an old shotgun house and knocked on the door. And kept knocking. And the elderly black man came to the door. We said, we're the Freedom Riders. We're in trouble. 
please let us in. He closed the door. And his wife heard us knocking again and knocking. She came and said to her husband, baby, please let them in. Let them in. Took the seven of us, placed us in the back room. We gave us, we, see, we had been, we went on a hunger strike. We hadn't had anything to eat since Tuesday night, May 16th. We left Nashville Wednesday morning, May 17th. This is early Friday morning now. Mm -hmm. So we gave this man, this gentleman, when daylight came, some money to go to a shop and get us some cold cuts. That's what we call cinnamon rolls. Mm -hmm. Anything, cheese, milk, juice, anything. And this man, bless his soul, so smart. He went to several different places, trying not to alarm or anybody, yeah. or make people aware, aware that he was buying all this food for us. And he brought the food back. We made a call back to Nashville. And a young lady by the name of Diane Nash, who helped coordinate the Freedom Rise. She was the leader in the Nashville movement. She wanted to know whether we wanted to come back to Nashville or did we want to go back to Birmingham. And she said to us, 11 other packages, this was a cold, had been shipped by other means. That meant that 11 other students mm -hmm. had left by train to continue the Freedom Ride. And we told her that we wanted to return to Birmingham. So she sent a car a young 18-year-old student at Tennessee State University, jumped in his car, drove to the spot where we were, and drove us back to Birmingham. And the two young men that had been arrested, they were released from jail, they joined us. One young lady, who was a student at Peabody College in Nashville, her father flew down from Buffalo, got her, and took her back uh, to Nashville. We arrived back, Reverend Shuttleworth in Birmingham, Fred Shuttleworth, one of the leaders, and 11 students met us. At 5 p.m., we went down to the Greyhound bus station to board the bus, and this bus driver made a classic statement. He said, I have only one life to give. I'm not going to give it to CORE or the NACP, and he refused to drive. And each time we would go out and try to board a bus, no bus driver would board, would board a bus and drive us. So we were kept in the so-called white waiting room. The Klan started marching around the station. They called out the dogs to try to protect us from the inside. And apparently Attorney General Robert Kennedy became so involved and so engaged because he thought it was very dangerous for us to be in Birmingham. At one point he said, let me speak to Mr. Greyhound. He wanted to know whether the Greyhound Company had any black bus drivers that would be willing to drive us out of Birmingham and make it to Montgomery. They discussed our problem, our situation with the officials of Greyhound and with the officials of the state of Alabama. And they made a decision that we would leave at 8.30 a.m. on that Saturday morning we boarded the bus. Mm -hmm. I was the spokesperson for the bus group. A private plane was flying over the bus. And every 15 miles, there was a patrol car. You could see the patrol car, and every so often you see the plane. And most of the Freedom Riders went to sleep, because they had been up all night in that station. We arrived in downtown Montgomery. The patrol car disappeared. There's not any sign of police present. And the moment we started down the steps of the bus, members of the media surrounded us. An angry mob just came out of nowhere. Started beating members of the press, destroying their cameras, their pad. During those days, the TV people had those old big cameras on their shoulder. They were destroying and beating the people, yeah. destroying the photographers, pads, and 
pins, and then they turn on us. My seatmate, young gentleman from Connecticut, from Wisconsin rather, was beaten. The two of us were beaten. I was hit in the head with a wooden crate. I was transferred to a doctor's office. And they put a patch on my head. It looked like the Red Cross symbol. And my seatmate was hospitalized for several days. A young man, can't think of his name right now, the public safety director of Alabama came with his gun and held it in the air and said, there'd be no killing here today. There'd be no killing here today. And the mob dispersed. All of the young women got in the cab, both black and white, but the cab driver said, I cannot drive you. Can I take you? Because in Montgomery, in 1961, black people and white people couldn't ride in the same taxi cab. And one of the young black women told the cab driver to get out. She would drive the cab. <laughs> refused to do it. So three of the young white women got out and started walking, trying to get away. And John Singathaler, mm -hmm. who was there representing President Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, he was uh, like assistant attorney general. The assistant point. attorney yeah. general. A Nashville, from Nashville, too. Yeah, yeah. had been in the newspaper business. He um, saw these three young ladies, and he suggested to them to jump in the car and get away from the mob. And they said to him, don't get hurt, sir. This is not your business. And while he was trying to communicate with them, someone in the mob walked up and hit him in the head with a lead pipe and left him black <clears throat> and unconscious. But because of what happened in Montgomery, President Kennedy federalized the Alabama National Guard, called out United States Marshal, put the city of Montgomery under martial law. And that next day on that Sunday, a group of us as Freedom Riders was in the church for a mass meeting, mass rally. The church was full. And if it hadn't been for the National Guard, the U.S. Marshals, mm -hmm. probably a lot of people would have been killed that night. The church could have been bombed or burned down. I will add parenthetically, of course, uh, John Segan Taylor. Uh, John Segan Taylor became the publisher of the Nashville, Tennessee, a number of years later. And, uh, great success story. It's a wonderful man. Yeah, wonderful guy. Wonderful friend. Um, are there people that, when these conversations occur, when you uh, are alone or with friends and you have your memories, are there names that we wouldn't find as familiar but are very important to you? Well, there were many young people, so smart and so gifted. I, I think, in a sense, we were maladjusted. Dr. King said we were maladjusted. <laughs> uh, to, to be willing to go in some of these places and get in trouble, mm -hmm. good trouble, necessary trouble. There was a young guy named James Belva, who was a classmate of mine. He was born in Illabina, Mississippi. His family moved to Cleveland, Ohio. Well, I believe that's the uh, hometown of Marion Berry. That's right, well, that's right. And, and, yeah. and Marion was, uh, was, was very much, very in, much in, in the Nashville movement. He yeah. was the first chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Yeah. And I became the third chair. But as a, as a student, as a graduate student at Fisher University, Marion was very, very involved. Yeah. And there was just plenty, unbelievable group of committed, dedicated young people. James, James Bevel. Ja James Bevel. was a great... He all, helped organize yeah. the Children Crusade in Birmingham. When you had waves of hundreds and thousands of young people that were willing to march to face bull hunters, dogs, the fire hoses. And you, you can go during that period to Birmingham and see that the water hoses, the fire hoses, were so powerful. They picked people up and dropped them. They took bark off of trees. You go, you go there and you walk through the 16th Street Baptist Church. There were some very brave young 
men and women. Even in Selma, the children. Cruci Jim Clark, one day this man, this mean man, that Sheriff, Jim for, Clark, Sheriff Jim Clark, he took a group of young people that was marching and sent them on a forced march. So if you want to march, he took them out on the highway and then chased them with men on horseback. Many of us went to jail and slept on floors in Selma. Yeah. Um, that raises, and by the way, we're <clears throat> inviting, I'm going to check my watch, we're going to uh, invite your questions in just a few minutes. But I, I think you so beautifully set up a question that I just, when I first uh, found out, I would be honored enough to be with you here tonight. This is just about the first question that occurred. But I'm honored to be with you. Well, no. And thank you. Um, I have two young children. I'm very glad that they are growing up in a, in a country in which they and their friends for the moment seem <clears throat> enormously casual about ethnicity, race, religion, skin color, all of that. Uh, doesn't seem to count for much. I'm glad for that. I consider it uh, a blessing in which you and many others and you a little more, or more than a little more, than millions of others are responsible for bringing that blessing to this country. Um, so I want them to be, to have the blessing of that hard-earned um, casualness in their life. On the other hand, what you did for this country and what others did for this country is part of their heritage too. And I want them, I want them to know what some brave people did to make this a better country. So how do, we, how do we teach those lessons to our children without scaring them, without introducing them to ideas that are, are well to be antiqued and banished from our midst? Well, you just have to make it plain and make it simple. I spend a lot of time talking to children. They come to my office from all over America young children, school groups. There's a group of what I call the KIPP students. And every year, the fifth graders from all over America, not come the same day, not the same time, <laughs> but they come. And I see hundreds and thousands of students on the steps of the Capitol. And we, we show um, photographs, very large photographs. They come to my office, the offices, they all can fit in. We show a 14-minute film mm -hmm. about what it was like growing up in the American South during the 40s and the 50s. We try to tell the story, we try to make it very simple. And let them see the signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. In my office, there's a uh, Photograph of a water fountain taken in a courthouse in Albany, Georgia. Taken in 1962. Beautiful, shining fountain, Mark White. Then just nearby, same room, only a step or two apart, is a spigot, Mark Color. And I tell these young people, I said, these signs are gone. They will not return. We brought down those signs. I said, the only place you see those signs will be in a book, in a museum, or maybe on a video. We live in a better country, and we are a better people. And sometimes I tell them the wind story from my book, Walking with the Wind. Mm -hmm. uh, that one day growing up in rural Alabama, when I was only about four and a half or five years old, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I had an aunt by the name of Seneva, and she lived in an old shotgun house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn, but a simple, plain dirt yard. And sometime at night, you can look up through the holes in the ceiling, 
through the holes in the tin roof and count the stars. And when it would rain, uh, she would get a pail, a bucket, a tub, and catch the rainwater. From time to time, she'd walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and make a broom, and she called that broom the breast broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard very clean, sometimes two and three times a week, but especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted that dirt yard to look good during the weekend. And I'm going to tell these little children that one day, one Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my French cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, while playing in my aunt's dirt yard, and this unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain just kept beating on the tin roof of the old shotgun house. And we cried, and we cried, and my aunt cried. We thought this old house was going to blow away. Then one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting. My aunt had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. <laughs> When the other corner appeared to be lifted, she had us to walk to that side. We were little children walking with the wind. But we never left the house. And I said to them, we all are little children. And it doesn't matter whether we're black or white, Latino, Asian American, or Native American. We all live in the same house. We're one family. And it's not just an American house. Not just the house of Washington, D.C., or the house of Georgia. It's the world house. And we must learn to live together. As Dr. King said, if we fail to learn to live together as brothers and sisters, we will perish as fools. Let us uh, <clears throat> invite your questions, if we could, now. Um, I think, yes. Yes, sir. Do we have we have two microphones? Yes, sir. Why don't you? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Lewis. First, thank you for that poetic end. And um, I think you were right to call it a revolution. It was not a peaceful revolution. Some people took the blows, and you were one of them. And I want to thank you for that. And I think I'm asking a question about the maladjusted issue. Um, I don't think um, I've ever heard you or anybody else address the question of fear. Um, you put yourself in harm's way, and we heard about that again tonight. Significant harm's way. Surely as you entered the bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina, um, or in other places, you knew what was about to happen to you when you saw the men come up to you. Or you knew what was happening when the news people were pulled off the bus and were beaten and left for dead. You knew what would surely happen to you. Or on the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. When did fear play a role um, in what you were doing? When did it test your resolve? Well, I, I, I must tell you, going through the nonviolent training, the nonviolent workshops, following the teaching of Gandhi, the teaching of the great teacher, following the teaching of Martin Luther King, Jr., studying Thoreau and civil disobedience, you, you come to that point where you say you're not afraid and you will not let fear conquer you. And you're going to stand up, you're going to speak up and speak out. And sometimes you can speak without urging a word or open your mouth just through your action. Many of us grew to accept nonviolence, not simply as a technique or as a tactic, but as a way of life, as a way of living. I lost all sense of fear. So you arrest me, you throw me in jail, 
You, you beat me? What else can you do? Dr. King would say on, on occasion, it is better, it may be better to die a physical death than to die a psychological death. So when I said be maladjusted, you have to be maladjusted to the wrongs, to the evil, to the injustice around you. And maybe some people call it being a little crazy. <laughs> that you know it's a possibility that you're going to be beaten. That you can down that bridge. But you have to go on and be not afraid. And sometimes you have to have what I call an executive session with yourself. <laughs> and, and just don't talk back to yourself. And say, I'm going on. Daddy King used to say, I'm going all the way to see what the end is going to be. And I often think during the movement, we didn't have uh, R and R. We didn't have a VA. We didn't go someplace. Maybe every now and then we went to a doctor's office or hospital and got a little patch here and a little patch there. And we got back out on the front line. We had to do it. If we didn't do it, what would happen? We were committed. Yes, yes um, I have a question for, for John. Um, in SNCC, you were succeeded by uh, Stokely Carmichael. And uh, later in life, obviously, your ideological positions diverged. Um, Stokely you know, later became the proponent for black political power and economic development. And to some extent, his, his uh, position was, um, was vindicated by the election of uh, Obama for the second term. I'm just curious, but later in life, he just took, I mean, his, some of his positions became somewhat outrageous. But how, how do you think history will treat him in terms of his legacy? And the other question is, uh, what led, I mean, I don't know how well you knew him, but what contributed to his ideological position, uh, divergent ideological position from yours in the, uh, as he progressed in life? Well, I first met uh, Stokely. You know, he had been a student here at Howard uh, University. And uh, he was from New York. He came south during the early 60s. Uh, I think he came from a different environment. The, the young people that came out of the city and went on the Freedom Ride, they came out of the South. They took the position, and I did also, that our struggle is not a struggle that lasts a one day, one week, one month, or one year, or one lifetime. It is an ongoing struggle, and you have to pace yourself. And we said to many of the young people that came from the North, black and white, that we will not solve the problem one summer or one semester. You have to take the long, hard look. I used to say to members of my family, I said to my staff now, I said to people in the movement, you have to pace yourself. You cannot be like a firecracker. Just pop off. You have to be like a pilot light and burn and burn and burn. I'm not so sure, and, and Stokely is not here to speak for himself, but there are some people, and I think, will they ever accept the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence? I heard people say, yes, I will practice the philosophy just for this protest, just for, but I'm not going to let it control me as a way of life, as a way of living. One of the ways I grew to accept non, the way of nonviolence, the way of peace, the way of love, to try to see every little child, every little baby, as someone that is innocent, without any problems, without any hang-ups, 
And so something happened. Is it the environment? So even a Sheriff Clark, uh, even a Governor Wallace, even the people that beat us, left us bloody, left us unconscious. If you come from where I come from, you will say in the bosom of every human being, there is a spark of the divine. And you must respect that and not abuse it. Let me go further. As you heard me say earlier, in 1961, we arrived at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery. The police department in the city of Montgomery made a decision that they would not be there to protect us. They wanted to give the mob an opportunity. This came out in the courts, hearings and everything, to beat us, to leave us bloody, to hurt us, to attempt to stop the Freedom Ride. But many years later, this past March, Second, we arrived in Montgomery and went to the First Baptist Church with several members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, members of the House and the Senate, staffers, all type of people, church folks. A young police chief came to the church to speak on behalf of the city, on behalf of the mayor. This young man was not even born during the Freedom Rides back in 1961. It was not even a dream. But he came up and he spoke and gave an unbelievable speech. And at one point he said to me, Congressman Lewis, I want to apologize for what happened on May the 20th, 1961. What the police department in Montgomery did was wrong. I want you to forgive us. And as a means, a way of showing that we want to repent, he said, I want to take my badge off and give it to you. And I said, Chief, I said, you can't do that. <laughs> You're the chief. You need your badge. I'm not worthy of accepting your badge. He said, I want you to have my badge. He took it off. He gave it to me. His deputy started crying. And all the members of that congregation, children, spouses, members of Congress started crying. That was a moment of reconciliation. I have the badge. And get a frame. I received a great letter from him a few days ago. I wrote him once some time ago. And I'm probably going to give it to some museum here in Washington, or in Alabama, Atlanta, or someplace. I see these pockets of changes all over the place. The same school that denied me a mission. In 1957, after I got elected to Congress, the same library that uh, wouldn't give us library cards in 1956, I went back there on July 5th, 1989, for a book signing on my book, Walking with the Wind. They gave me a library card. <laughs> and Troy, not, not Troy State University, but Troy University, a few years ago, a gay man on a river degree, and Senator Hal Heffernan was the commencement speaker. So change, you just hang in there. You keep the faith. You never give up. You never become bitter or hostile, and it all will work out. You know, it's none of my business, but it occurs to me you should hold on to that badge a little while longer, because you'll never get a speeding ticket in Montgomery. <laughs> Just keep that nearby and, you know. I guess you will. Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman Lewis, you're one of my heroes, and President Obama is another one of my heroes. And I'd like to ask you, in your heart of hearts, what would you most like to see the president do with the rest of his term to continue the work that you started 50 years ago? And I'll take my answer off the air, Scott. 
Well, I would love to see the president and the Congress working with the president pass comprehensive immigration reform and do it and do it now. Too many of our brothers and sisters living in the shadow. It's not right, it's not fair, and it's not just. For hundreds and thousands of people in many parts of our country to be living in fear, that's not the American way. We must do it. I'd like to see more resources spent to educate all of our children in much less I would I'd like to see the president, and not, it's not the president alone, working with Congress, spend more resources on saving this little piece of real estate, this little piece of our planet, for generation yet unborn. We have a right to know what is in the food we eat. We have a right to know what in the water we drink. What is in the air we breathe. Save the environment. Not just for ourselves, but for those that are coming after us. And we got to put people back to work and create jobs. And do what we can. The president and those working with him to create a world community at peace with us. We don't need more bombs and missiles and guns. We just don't. War is obsolete as a tool of our foreign policy. Let me, let me put you in a tricky position as a follow-up, as someone who's been a student of, of nonviolence and Gandhian principles. Um, Drone warfare. Well, well, let me tell you. Yeah. As a as a member of Congress, I don't vote for preparation for war, so I don't support that. Hmm. I do not support it. It would be a butcher of my conscience. So, if you notice when a vote come up, mm -hmm. I support our troops. When I see a young man or a young woman in uniform, I say thank you for your service. When I see a police officer on the Capitol steps, walking down the way, and they all said to me from time to time, well, they think I should be probably bitter or hostile or not, they say, you the best member of Congress. I wish there were more people like you. Because I speak to them. I call them brother, sister, how you doing? But in good conscience, I do not want to be a party to violence and to war. We got to end it. Yes. I've heard uh, bits and pieces of your story, and I must tell you that I'm still laughing and I'm still crying. We have friends on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota to whom the poverty level is an aspiration. But when they gather together, they march behind the veterans and with the American flag. Your story and their story coincide in that you both love this country for the idea and the process of becoming. Are you worried that there are some forces among us who shall remain nameless, <laughs> perhaps, um, who are obstructing progress and are gathering steam, or do you think they're just a bit of a speed bump? No, I, I'm concerned. I just think that good forces, good people, we've been too quiet. We need to make a little noise and get in some good trouble. <laughs> and we just got to continue to push. 
You have to create a coalition of conscience again. And not be afraid. Be daring. Be courageous. And build a strong movement. But no one, but no one is left out or left behind. During the 70s, I had an opportunity during the Carter administration to get out and visit some of the Native American sites and, and spend some time. Uh, about two years ago, I went and, and, and visited, uh, in Oklahoma, visit the Cherokees. More of us need to get out there and see how other people are living and try to walk in their shoes. Yes, ma'am. Congressman Lewis, um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to know if during the civil rights movement, did a any of the nonviolent uh, civil rights leaders have interaction or have any type of, I guess, discourse with those in the civil rights movement who were not as uh, patient and not as nonviolent? And if so, what kind of interactions were they? Were they basically, were you trying to convert them, bring them over to your side, or were you just aware that they were there and just just kind of went your separate ways? No, uh, dur during the uh, 60s, um, late 60s, early 60s, we did talk, we did meet, uh, trying to convince, and I wouldn't say convert, but uh, saying the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence is a better way. It's a more excellent way. Uh, and the nonviolent movement, everybody can participate. Just believe in love, peace. Dr. King was said in a very funny way, he said, John, what we need to do, just love the hell out of everybody. <laughs> just, just love everybody. I remember the night before the march on Washington, Malcolm was in, I guess we called it the Capitol Hilton Hotel at 16th and K, was in that most of the march participant leaders stayed in that hotel and he was in the lobby. And another time after the march, he would argue with us. I said, why are you all going and going to jail, getting arrested and getting beaten? Well, after he went to Mecca, and came back, he was a changed man. Mm -hmm. He was trying to identify with the movement. And I believe it was March 14th, 1965, he came to Selma, and we all were in jail. And the local official wouldn't allow him to visit us. And he spoke at the Brown Chapel AME Church no, it was February the 14th. Hmm. It was February the 14th. The same church that we marched from to a group of high school students with Dr. Martin Luther King, with Coretta Scott King. Dr. King was in jail. Seven days later, he was assassinated. Hmm. It's my belief that if Malcolm had lived, he would have been marching with us, believing in the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. He will begin to change. I've taken a position some years ago that if I'm the last person who believe in the possibility, in the reality, of a truly multiracial, democratic society living by the way of peace, love, and nonviolence, then I would be that person. The philosophy of nonviolence, for me, is one of those immutable principles that you cannot deviate from or turn away from. If you want to create the beloved community, if that is the end, if that is the goal, then the way must be one of love. 
one of peace, one of nonviolence. A community that respects the dignity and the worth of every human being. That's the good society. It's a better society. A society at peace with itself. Hi, uh, I wanted to thank you so much for being with us tonight. And um, thanks to you and the giants you have and have not mentioned tonight. Um, we've come a long way, but I wonder where we still have to go. And um, with that, I was wondering if you could share some of your thoughts about the cases before the Supreme Court right now concerning the um, Voter Rights Act and the National Voter Registration Act and how um, the cost constitutionality of portions of those are in question. I was wondering um, what you think about that and, and where we still have to go with um, voting equality. Well, you're going to get me uh, in trouble. <laughs> in trouble. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. It's, it, 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 it's, it's all right. It, well, it is my hope that uh, when the court makes the decision within the next few days that it would uphold Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That is the heart. <laughs> that is the heart and soul of the Voting Rights Act. My view is that the vote is precious. It is almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool or instrument that we have in a democratic society. It doesn't matter whether you're rich, middle class, or low income. We all have one vote. And it should be easy. It should be simple. I think President Carter said on one occasion, being able to vote should be as simple as getting a glass of water. I take it personally. I really do. My own mother and father, my own grandparents, when I was growing up, could not register to vote until after the Voting Rights Act was passed and signed into law on March 7, 1965. My great, great grandfather, who had been a slave, After the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the first things he did, he married the woman that he loved. And the second thing he did, he registered to vote. So I said to someone some time ago, it must be in my DNA <laughs> to fight for the right to register, the right to vote. If the Supreme Court make a decision and go the other way, it would be a major setback. To open up America, President Obama said about the long lines, he said, well, let's fix it. It doesn't make sense in this day and age with all of the new technology for people to have to stand in long line, for people to say so you got to have an ID We can do better, and we must do it. It's the right thing to do. Yes, Congressman Lewis, thank you so much for, for everything. Um, you spoke about, about the way of nonviolence, that it's a way of life, um, that the way of nonviolence was of, of no fear. Um, could you speak about in those times where, where um, you were being asked by the police whether or not you wanted to prosecute, in times of moments of, of your truth where your strength came out, um, were there ever any thoughts of, of turning to violence, of turning to, to those ways? And if not, where did that strength come from? I never, never contemplated, I never considered uh, to lay down the way of peace, 
love, and nonviolence. It is for me a way of life. Now, you know, violence is not just striking someone. Words can be very violent. Even if you contemplate and are thinking, it may set you off in a different way. Our thoughts, the way we live. See, sometimes in America, I think we're afraid to say, I'm sorry, excuse me, pardon me. Can we be just a little more human? And just treat everybody the right way, respect people. Why do we have to be so mean to each other? Sometimes I think in the Congress, we need to conduct a nonviolent workshop. Uh, <clears throat> sure, I think we can take another question. Yeah. Are you uh, waiting? Earlier this evening, there was a brief mention of your protests against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, what parallels do you see between what happened in this country in the 50s and 60s and what happened in South Africa a few decades later? Well, I made, uh, I've been to South Africa a, a few times, but I remember going there, um, I guess in 94. Was it 94? Or was it? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I was just I know, been, I, we weren't uh, together. Then. No, 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 no. That's right. We were in. <laughs> well, I, just, just before the election, b before the election, and a group of us, members of Congress, men and women, Democrats and Republicans, we were in the uh, in Johannesburg, and we were supposed to go and meet with a group of young people, and some violence broke out and the streaks, and uh, the Secretary of State was in the process of leaving, coming back, and they suggested that we go to a hotel in downtown Johannesburg to meet with a group of activists, a group of young people. And they started telling their story of protests through music, through drama. And some of the words, phrases, was so similar to the protests and words, music that we had in this country during the 60s. And to talk to these young people, the students, they were greatly influenced by what we were doing. And I remember back in Nashville as a student, some of the African students would say the whole of Africa would be free before we were able to get a hamburger and a soda at a lunch counter. And then the NACP had a slogan, free by 63. You remember that? The 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Prime, free by 63. And when these young people finished their presentation, they asked the Americans, these members of Congress, Democrats, Republicans, men, women to respond. We couldn't respond. We were so moved, we were so overcome. And a young African playwright, poet, got up and cited a poem by a slave woman from Georgia. We couldn't say anything. We all stood together and started singing, we shall overcome. And we cried together. And that was the end of that meeting. I remember going meeting Nelson Mandela. He knew everything about me. Meeting Bishop Tutu, knew everything. Other leaders, we hugged, we cried. The protest there was very similar to the protests here. But we had a creed. We had something to look toward. We have certain principles. What, ha what happened in South Africa, what happened in this country, I think we were moving together to create a new South Africa 
and to create a new America. We, uh, I'm afraid, have reached the, uh, the, the end of our scheduled time here. I know um, uh, there will be an opportunity, I think, for people to be able to say hello to you. Yes. Um, I think this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be able to say hello. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. How are you doing? And you know, and Nelson Mandela.